Hello and welcome to session zero of Editing School 2022, Introduction to MR Physics. Looking forward to seeing most of you in person about a week from now in Mexico. My name is Georg Ochner, and today I'm going to introduce you to the basic physics that are behind the phenomenon of magnetic resonance. The purpose of this lecture is to give a lightning fast overview into the fundamental physics of nuclear magnetic resonance without requiring too much understanding of physics. So we will first be talking about the way that magnets and nuclear spins behave in a magnetic field. Then we will discuss how we can excite magnetization, how it relaxes back to equilibrium after excitation. We'll learn how the signal that we receive behaves over time and how this behavior translates to frequency. And finally, we'll talk about how we use radio frequency pulses and magnetic field gradients to conduct a spectroscopic experiment. This lecture is for you if you are not sure what these words mean. If you have any form of experience with MRS in particular or MRI in general, chances are that the contents of this lecture is not entirely new to you. You're welcome to skip this one and move on to the next lectures in that case. Of course, you're also welcome to stick around. Learning the concepts of MR from a slightly different perspective can still help improve your intuition. And remember, you can always come back to this lecture at any time. There will be substantial overlap between the contents of this lecture and some of the other editing school lectures. For example, MR Spectrum, Pulse Sequence and J Difference Editing Explained. This is intentional since this lecture deliberately pre-introduces the most important terms and concepts that will repeatedly show up in the later lectures. A brief course called Introduction to MR Physics is inevitably going to fall short and miss out on a lot of important terms and details since entire textbooks and lectures have been named Introduction to MR Physics. For those of you who would like to extend further on the contents of this crash course, um, I would like to refer to you um, to two excellent textbooks. Most of the illustrations that you will see on the following slides are taken from these two books. The first one is the latest edition of In Vivo NMR Spectroscopy by Robin de Graaf. He's an icon in the world of MRS, and he actually started writing this textbook as a PhD student when he found that there just was no good textbook around. It covers a lot of the ground that you'll see throughout the entire course. Basics of NMR, hardware, data processing, analysis. It's really fantastic and I highly recommend it uh, to everyone who would like to get a comprehensive um, overview of the field. Um, the second book comes from a slightly different angle by James Keeler from Cambridge University. He's a theoretical chemist and it describes the quantum mechanics behind the basic uh, NMR effects and goes a lot deeper into the theory behind NMR spectroscopy. Um, you find a lot of the content of um, both books online, also as YouTube videos, and I will link to those online resources in the channel info as well. So we're starting our journey into magnetic resonance by focusing on the magnetic part of that phrase first. The phenomenon of um, magnetic resonance can be derived and described from different perspectives. I've decided to come from the classical analogy of a compass needle in an external magnetic field, and we'll only briefly touch quantum mechanics at the surface. While quantum mechanics allow a complete and correct description of MR, it is less intuitive and it's certainly more important for this course to have a rather intuitive pictorial understanding of what's going on. Um, if you would like to learn more about the quantum mechanical development, feel free to dig into the Keeler textbook. We're simply starting with a magnetic needle as you find it in a compass. That needle is a bar magnet that has a certain strength and has a north pole and a south pole. And we can pretty much characterize this system with a vector because a vector is a mathematical object that has an amplitude and a direction. In this context, we'll call this vector the magnetic moment. And this vector points along the axis between the north and the south pole of the needle. And as you know, if there is no magnetic field at all, the needle can pretty much point in any direction. That changes if we bring it into an external magnetic field the needle will reorient itself such that the magnetic moment is parallel to the direction of the magnetic field lines. And after a while, the needle will stand still in that position and we have a state of equilibrium. Now, you also know what happens when you hit the tip of the needle with your finger and you move it out of the equilibrium. The needle wants to go back to being aligned with the field, but while doing so, it overshoots and swings in the opposite direction. Over time though, because there's friction where the needle is mounted, 
This oscillating movement dampens until the needle comes to rest again. Now imagine the compass needle is inside a compass behind glass, so we can't touch it with our hands. In that case, we can of course use a magnet instead to do the pushing. North pole on north pole causes repulsion, so if we take this magnet and move it left towards the needle, that's the same as pushing it with your finger, exerting a force on the tip of the needle, and applying torque to make the needle rotate. Let's now imagine we're moving this magnet from left to right while the needle is swinging. If we don't get the timing right, we're not doing anything constructive and the needle won't go far from the parallel orientation. However, if we do time it right, we can make the needle move further and further every time. It's like when you're pushing your friend on a swing set, you have to match the frequency of your pushes to the frequency of the swing. And this frequency is what we call the resonance frequency. Now, if we don't want to move our magnet from left to right all the time, we can also replace it with a solenoid. And that is an electromagnet created by winding a coil. And we send an alternating current through it. And this coil then produces an oscillating magnetic field that changes direction and amplitude periodically. That's equivalent to moving a bar magnet back and forth, and we can do it much faster. And finally, using a coil is great because we can do another thing with it. Once we switch off the oscillating electromagnetic field, the needle still swings back and forth, and it starts to return to equilibrium. And we can monitor this process. Because when a magnetic moment is moving close to an electrical conductor, it induces a voltage in this conductor. And this is how a bicycle dynamo works, for example, to generate light from rotation. This is the same principle. We just record this voltage over time. So this is the classical analogy to what's going on actually inside an MR scanner. We have seen that we can describe magnetic resonance quite nicely using a compass needle and a magnetic field. Now, what about the nuclear part of nuclear magnetic resonance? Turns out that atomic nuclei consist of subatomic particles like electrons, neutrons, and protons. And all of these possess a fundamental intrinsic property that we call the spin. The spin is often visualized as a sort of angular momentum and the particles as revolving around themselves. And while it's helpful to do so, the spin is actually something more like a charge, something that these particles just have instead of something that they do. In any case, if a nucleus has non-zero spin, it ultimately behaves in many ways like a small compass needle. So each and every nucleus with non-zero spin has, like the compass needle, a magnetic moment that's defined by its amplitude and its direction. The simplest nucleus with a non-zero spin that we can imagine is the hydrogen nucleus, which is you've guessed it, just simply a proton. And since every water molecule has two hydrogens and about 80% of the human body is water, we have a lot of protons in the brain. So that's about 10 to the power of 19 in a microliter of brain. Now in the absence of a magnetic field, the water molecules are tumbling around randomly and the magnetic moments of the protons are randomly oriented in space. So the little compass needles, they point in all sorts of directions without any preference. Now, if you freeze this picture at any given moment in time and collect all the little arrows and put them together at their start, like a bouquet of flowers, you would see something like this. This is a spin sphere consisting of all the little magnetic moments. And if you now add up all of these arrows representing little bar magnets, the vector sum of those arrows would amount to zero. Or in other words, this sample of 10 to the power of 19 protons does not have a net magnetization, even though each proton itself acts like a tiny little magnet. All of this changes when we are in an external magnetic field. In MR physics, this field is often called the B0 field. So we'll hear B0 a lot from now on. B0 can be as little as the magnetic field of the Earth, or as strong as a clinical MRI scanner. Now remember that compass needles will align along an external magnetic field and come to rest. And here's the big difference between a compass needle and the magnetic moment of a proton. The proton spin cannot perfectly align along the direction of a magnetic field. 
And the reason for that is in quantum mechanics, and I promise you we're not going down that road for now. It's just important to remember in an external magnetic field P0, there are two possible configurations for the spin, either parallel to the direction of P0 or anti-parallel to the direction of P0. In MR physics, we often agree on a coordinate system that arbitrarily puts the z-axis in the direction of the B0 field and the x and y directions perpendicular to that. And that notation, we can take a closer look at what the spin actually does. So as mentioned on the previous slide, here we see that it becomes the z component of the magnetic moment that assumes one of two positions at a fixed value that's either parallel or anti-parallel to B0. So this picture shows the parallel configuration, for example. Now the absolute value or the length of the magnetic moment mu does not change. And as a consequence, the x and y components of the magnetic moment move around on a circle around the direction of B0. So as a whole, the magnetic moment nutates around on a cone. And we call this nutation movement precession. So it turns out that the angular frequency omega with which this precession occurs is directly proportional to B0. And this frequency is so important that it has its own name. We call it the Larmor frequency. The stronger the magnetic field, the higher the Larmor frequency, the faster the magnetic moment of each proton nutates around B0. The proportionality factor gamma is called the gyromagnetic ratio, and it has been precisely determined for the nuclei that show this behavior. And here you see that the value for protons in the right-hand column, um, omega is about 42.5 megahertz per tesla. And that means that on a clinical three tesla scanner, each proton spins um, precesses about 128 million times per second. So at any given moment, spins will precess around an external magnetic field at the Larmor frequency. Now, if this were the only effect that P0 has on spins, we wouldn't be able to do much with it. Fortunately for us, there is a second effect. As we've mentioned before, if a magnetic field is present, the Z component of the magnetic moment can only assume two values, corresponding to the Z component being parallel to the field and anti-parallel. Quantum mechanics tells us now that these two positions represent two different quantum mechanical states, which have two different energy levels. As we can see in this image, the anti-parallel state has a higher energy level and the parallel state has a lower energy level. And if you think classically, for example, a compass needle that's aligned anti-parallel to the field has kinetic energy stored in it, because as soon as you let it go, it'll flip and align itself in the parallel configuration. Now, statistical mechanics tell us another thing. Individual spins will jump between these two energy levels all the time due to molecular motion. However, at large, a spin is slightly more likely to be in the lower energy state and slightly less likely to be in the high energy state. The difference in population for a three Tesla scanner at room temperature is really tiny, maybe one in a million spins. So what does that mean? It means that in a large sample with a lot of spins, like the 10 to the power of 19 spins in our one microliter brain, there is a bias for the spins being aligned parallel to the external magnetic field. Their X and Y components are still randomly distributed, as you see here, but if you count the spins on each level, you'll see we have 11 spins pointing up here and only eight pointing down. And if we now do the vector summation over a large number of magnetic moments again, the X and Y components cancel each other out, but the Z components are biased in the direction of B0. And what that means is that our sample as a whole has a macroscopic magnetization that we just call M. And like any magnetization, it has a direction, for now the same as B0, and an amplitude. And at rest, that amplitude will depend on the number of spins N, on the magnetic field B0, and on the temperature. And the more spins, obviously, the stronger the magnetization. The magnetization also grows with B0, which is why we're seeing efforts to go to higher field strength all the time. 
and less relevant for us, but there's more magnetization if the temperature is low. So this is what actually happens when we put a person into a magnetic field. The person is 80% water, and each water molecule has two protons. Each proton is processing around the magnetic field, but the precession is random. The Z components add up to a tiny macroscopic magnetization of the sample. And it turns out that MR imaging and spectroscopy are ultimately all about pushing this macroscopic magnetization around, and then watching it return to a state of equilibrium. And we'll now take a look at how that works. First things first, think back to the compass needle. If you nudge it out of its equilibrium position, it will start swinging back and forth. Uh, similarly, if we nudge the macroscopic magnetization out of its equilibrium position, which is parallel to the z-axis, it will start processing around the z-axis just like the individual spins do. And just like the individual spins, the frequency with which it will do that is the Lamo frequency. And remember that the Lamo frequency is directly proportional to the external magnetic field B0. So we can't just use our finger to poke the magnetization around. So how do we actually do it? How do we nudge it out of its equilibrium? How do we make the magnetization precess? It helps to think back to the classical compass needle again. As we saw before, we can change the orientation of the compass needle with an additional magnetic field perpendicular to the magnetic moment of the needle. In MR physics, we like to give this additional magnetic field a name too, and since B0 is already taken by the external static magnetic field, this additional field is called B1, which is obviously not particularly inventive. We also saw that we can make the compass needle oscillate stronger and stronger if we have this additional field B1 oscillate at the resonance frequency. In the same way, we can use an additional magnetic field B1 that is perpendicular to the external field to nudge our magnetization vector around. Since the precession occurs in two dimensions, the B1 field here needs to oscillate in two dimensions as well. So if we visualize the B1 field as a vector here in blue, and it rotates around the z-axis at the Lamo frequency, so if it matches the precession frequency of the magnetic moment, it will have the same effect as B1 does on the compass needle. While it is processing around the z-axis, the angle between the magnetization vector and the z-axis grows, so that the tip describes a spiral that is moving towards the xy plane. And we call this entire process of making the magnetization precess excitation. The movement of the magnetization and the additional magnetic field B1 obviously becomes quite difficult to describe and visualize because of the precession that's going on all the time. With constant rotation, it becomes rapidly too complex to describe mathematically, but also in our imagination. And a common concept that you will see over and over in the theory of MR is the so-called rotating frame. So until now, we've looked at the magnetization and what it does from the outside. We're sitting in our chair in a laboratory and we're observing that the magnetization precesses around the z-axis. A good analogy is sitting in your chair and listening to a classic vinyl record and trying to read the label. Now, if you're doing that, it's difficult because the label is constantly spinning and the frame of reference that you're in when you see the record spinning is the so-called laboratory frame. Now, an alternative way to look at the world is by jumping onto the record while it's spinning. Now, the world around you is spinning at the frequency of the record, but the record remains stationary in your world, and you can finally read the label without a problem. And this new frame of reference is therefore called the rotating frame. Now, translated to the magnetization, this means that we're jumping on a coordinate system that rotates around the z-axis at the Lamo frequency. Um, another way to visualize this is to imagine jumping on a merry-go-round. So once you jump on the merry-go-round, everything that's also on the merry-go-round looks stationary to you. Now, once we've made that jump, what does the movement of the magnetization vector and the B1 field vector look like? 
If the red magnetization vector is precessing at Larmor frequency around the z-axis while also being pushed down towards the xy plane, and if the blue B1 magnetic field vector is rotating at Larmor frequency around the z-axis too, and if the coordinate system is also rotating at Larmor frequency around the z-axis, then when we jump into that rotating coordinate system, the blue B1 vector is going to appear stationary along the x prime axis, which is the x axis of the rotating frame. And the red magnetization vector is only moving down towards the x prime y prime plane, but we're not going to see the precession any longer. More precisely, what we will see is that the magnetization vector rotates around the B1 vector. Imagine you're sitting on a merry-go-round and you're waving your arm to your friend standing next to it. From your perspective in the rotating frame, your arm is simply moving up and down, like the one on the right here. But for your friend looking at you from the laboratory frame going round on the merry-go-round, your arm will make a movement that looks a lot like the one on the left. Just as a reminder, you'll see on the right-hand side, we create this additional B1 field through a solenoid coil that acts as an electromagnet. The additional magnetic field B1 is usually only switched on for a short period of time, typically milliseconds. Um, remember that B1 is only stationary in the rotating frame, but in the uh, laboratory frame, it has to oscillate with the Larmor frequency. For protons in the field of a typical MR scanner, that will be on the order of magnitude of 100 megahertz. And those are frequencies used in radio transmission. So that's an easy way to remember why we're calling these short bursts of additional magnetic fields radio frequency pulses or RF pulses. Generally, the longer we have the additional B1 field, the further our magnetization will rotate away from the z-axis, just like the compass needle will swing further, or like you're pushing your friend higher and higher on a swing set. And the angle between the magnetization and the z-axis after a pulse is called the flip angle. Now for low flip angles there is a linear relationship between the pulse duration t and the flip angle theta, but that does not hold up quite well for larger flip angles. RF pulses are one of the two basic building blocks of any NMR experiment. Depending on what they're supposed to accomplish, they come in an enormous variety. And one way to classify them is by their flip angle and also by their stated purpose. So just two basic examples. On the left, the additional B1 field points in the direction of the x-axis. And as we've seen, that makes the magnetization vector rotate around B1. If we do that for a certain period of time, the magnetization vector will point along the minus y-axis because the flip angle is exactly 90 degrees here. This is a 90 degree pulse with respect to the x-axis and we call that an excitation pulse. We can leave on B1 for longer than that and that will just make the magnetization vector rotate further around B1. We can end up on the minus z-axis which corresponds to a 180 degree rotation and we also call this an inversion pulse because, well, we invert the magnetization. I've told you before that at the heart of every NMR experiment, it's about nudging magnetization out of equilibrium and then watch it return back to equilibrium. Excitation, as we've just seen, was the first half of that. And relaxation, or what happens after we stop excitation, is the second half of that. So once we switch off the excitation, essentially two different mechanisms begin. The first one is longitudinal relaxation, which means that the magnetization in the direction of B0 recovers to its equilibrium state before excitation. And the second one is transversal relaxation, which means that the magnetization perpendicular to B0 decays back to zero, which is also where it was before excitation. Now these are just the hard facts that I'm throwing at you at the first occasion because they're super important to remember, but let's look at each of those in a bit more detail and understand why they happen. So first, longitudinal relaxation. 
Remember that immediately after a 90 degree pulse, we have rotated the magnetization vector into the xy plane. That means that we have no net magnetization in the direction of B0 because the magnetization vector is just the sum of all the individual magnetic moments from the protons, right? That means we have the same amount of protons in the state that's anti-parallel to B0 as we have protons in the state that's parallel to B0. However, the antiparallel state has a higher energy level than the parallel state, and without external energy addition through radio frequency pulses, the spins will over time return to the configuration that is energetically favorable. So over time, they will drop down into the parallel configuration again. And as more and more spins do that, their Z will add up again and keep growing back towards the macroscopic magnetization at equilibrium M0. So that keeps happening until we're reaching equilibrium again, as it was before we applied the excitation pulse. It turns out that the recovery of the Z component of the macroscopic magnetization follows an exponential growth curve that plateaus at equilibrium magnetization M0. We can characterize this behavior with a single number, and that is the time after which 63% of M0 has recovered. This number is called T1, the longitudinal relaxation time constant, and we can measure T1 for different metabolites and at different field strength. T1 generally is different between different metabolites, and it also varies between different types of tissue. And it generally increases with magnetic field strength, although that relationship gets weaker for higher field strengths, higher than, let's say, 3 tesla. So much for the longitudinal magnetization, but what happens to the component of the magnetization in the xy plane? To understand this, we will introduce the concept of the phase. Phase is a term that you will hear over and over throughout editing school, Imagine again that we start at a time zero immediately after a 90 degree excitation pulse. So our magnetization vector is entirely in the transversal plane, orthogonal to the external magnetic field. Let's look at it from the outside, from the laboratory frame. And we then have the magnetization vector precess around the direction of the external magnetic field. And that means here pointing at us from inside the screen. Now, after a certain brief time period, tau 1, it has precessed through a certain angle, epsilon 1, proportional to the Lamov frequency. And at a time period, tau 2, it has precessed through a larger angle, epsilon 2. And this angle, at any given point, is what we call the phase. Now, obviously, over time, we can describe the position of the vector relatively easily because the x and y components will always move around on that circle and it turns out that we can describe that circular motion as cosine and sine functions of the angle which means of the phase at any given time. Why did we introduce the concept of phase? Well so far we've assumed that our external magnetic field B0 is exactly the same everywhere throughout our sample and that there is exactly one Lamov frequency and that all the spins in our sample precess at exactly that Lamov frequency. It turns out it's not that easy because the spins themselves are little bar magnets. They do influence their surroundings. They are constantly in Brownian motion. They come near to each other. They attract and repel each other. And in short, there are local field fluctuations all the time and spins actually have different Lamov frequencies all the time. And what that means is that their magnetization vectors precess with slightly different rates. So when immediately after excitation they point it in one direction, after a while some of them will have precessed through a larger angle if they have larger Lamov frequencies, and others will have precessed through a shorter angle if they have smaller Lamov frequencies. It's like a bunch of clocks they're all going at a slightly different speed and you look at them to compare the time 12 hours later and they don't all show the same time. 
Now, if you add the arrows up, as we've done previously, the vector sum will be smaller. So the macroscopic transversal magnetization is getting smaller and smaller over time until all the spins are completely out of sync and cancel each other out entirely. Like the longitudinal T1 relaxation, this process follows an exponential path back to equilibrium. In the case of transversal magnetization, that equilibrium is zero, because remember, at equilibrium, our magnetization vector points exactly along the z-axis, which means there is no magnetization in the x or y directions. We characterize this decay with the transversal relaxation time constant T2, which is the time when the transversal magnetization has dropped to 37% of the amount after the excitation pulse. And like T1, we find that this is both depending on the metabolite you're looking at and the tissue. And in contrast to T1, we find that T2 generally decreases with field strength. For most applications, however, the actual signal decay that we observe occurs even faster than with T2. The reason for that is that on top of the local field fluctuations that are caused by the interactions of the spins with each other, there are also static magnetic field inhomogeneities. And they typically result from the fact that tissue isn't homogeneous. And at every interface between tissue and air, for example, or between different tissue types, we see discontinuities in the way that a static magnetic field forms. So this might look something like this, where on a small scale, the magnetic field varies. As we've seen previously, if the magnetic field varies, the Lamov frequency varies, and the transversal magnetization picks up different phase angles over time, and they start cancelling each other out. And since that happens on top of the regular T2 decay, the signal decays a lot faster. So this combined decay is referred to by the time constant T2 star. Fortunately, we can at least get back the signal that we lose from static magnetic field inhomogeneities with a so-called spin echo sequence, but more on that in some of the later lectures of editing school. Finally, let's briefly overlay the time courses of T1 recovery and T2 decay. It's worth noting that they do happen simultaneously. So while the loss of phase coherence happens, the spins are also flipping back into their parallel state, causing the magnetization to grow back. However, T2 is generally a lot shorter than T1, meaning that the transversal relaxation has disappeared much faster than the longitudinal one has recovered. So while we can think of excitation as a momentous rotation of the magnetization vector, relaxation doesn't simply mean that the vector as a whole rotates back to the z-axis. Okay, so now that we have looked at excitation and relaxation of the magnetization of a sample, we can inch a bit closer towards MR spectroscopy and understand how we generate an MRS signal. We're talking about observing the magnetization relax, but in fact, we obviously can't see any arrows rotate. So what is the signal that we're actually detecting? Um, again, we can refer back to the compass needle that we saw earlier. Remember the principle of the bicycle dynamo. Once we turn off the electromagnet that we use to drive the compass needle, the swinging needle induces a voltage in the exact same electromagnet and we simply record this voltage over time. And turns out we do exactly the same thing in an MR scanner. The same coil that we use to transmit the additional B1 field is used as a receiver now. The magnetization that's precessing after being excited induces a voltage that we record. And here it also becomes clear why we need excitation to begin with. In order for voltage to be induced in this coil, the magnetization needs to move. If we don't excite, the magnetization stays along the z-axis forever. So that would be like waiting for a bicycle dynamo to produce light, but without ever pedaling. So 
Only with an excitation pulse do we make the macroscopic magnetization precess, and only then are we able to actually detect it. So we record the voltage that this rotating magnetization induces in the coil, and you see from the trajectory of the tip what we've learned previously. First we see that it keeps rotating with the Lamo frequency, so that the signal that we receive will have the characteristics of a sine or a cosine signal. And second, we see that it decays over time due to T2 relaxation. So the sine or cosine signal will grow smaller over time. And lo and behold, that is precisely what the signal that we detect looks like. In practice, we don't just record it with a coil pointing along the x-axis, but also simultaneously along the y-axis. And that was what we call quadrature detection. We're essentially recording the same signal twice. We're listening to it in stereo, if you want. And we do that because it gives us a better signal to noise ratio overall. Since the x and the y-axis have a geometric 90 degree angle between each other, the signal in one channel is always a quarter of an oscillation cycle or 90 degrees phase behind the other. The two parts of this recorded signal are referred to as the real and the imaginary part of a complex number, although they're really just shifted versions of each other. Um, and bear in mind, none of them is more real than the other. They are both real signal recordings. They just follow the naming conventions of complex numbers. So let's plot the time course of both channels, the real and the imaginary one, in the same plot. And we see even clearer here that they're the same signal just shifted by a quarter of a cycle. So when one signal is at a maximum or a minimum, the other goes through a zero crossing and vice versa. And it's weighted by the T2 star decay that we've learned about in the last section. We also see that the time difference between two maxima is just the inverse of the frequency of the signal. This signal is what we call the so-called free induction decay, or FID, which is a term that you will hear and read all over the literature and in this course. Since the time is on the x-axis, we call this the time domain signal. From there, we're just a brief famous mathematical operation from finally seeing a spectrum if we take the Fourier transform of the time domain signal, we arrive at the real and imaginary frequency domain spectra. This spectrum reveals how the time domain signal that we measured is decomposed into elementary periodic signals with certain frequencies. Here, the real part of the frequency domain spectrum is a nice narrow symmetrical line, which we call the absorption line shape. And the imaginary part, well, it looks like this. We call it the dispersion line shape. Now, if you look at this spectrum, we see that it has a single peak only. And that makes sense because the time domain signal does seem to have a pretty clear oscillation at one frequency only. However, Fourier transform really, really shines when it comes to time domain signals like shown here. This is a really messy looking signal. If we just looked at its time behavior, we'd have no way of telling what's going on in the signal. But the frequency domain spectrum on the right-hand side shows us that it's a superposition of signals with three different frequencies. And each signal contributes with a different intensity to the overall signal. And it turns out that the amplitude of each signal contribution is proportional to the area under each peak in the frequency domain spectrum. And that is what ultimately allows MR to be a quantitative technique. Now, with all this knowledge, let us understand why we can do spectroscopy of molecular compounds in the first place. And it will be incredibly useful for us that the local chemical environment surrounding a nucleus changes the Lamo frequency. So let's start with a lone proton in an external magnetic field B0. There is nothing else going on, so the field Bn that the proton feels is exactly the same as B0. So we know the proton spin will precess at Lamo frequency, 
and we can record a free induction TK of that and we will get a single line at Lamo frequency. Now everything changes if we consider a hydrogen atom instead, which is not only a proton but also an electron surrounding it. The electron clouds in atoms and molecules do something incredibly interesting. They shield the nucleus that they surround. So while B0 is the same in this picture, the effective field Bn that the proton feels is lower. And if the effective field is lower, the Lamo frequency of the proton inside the electron cloud will decrease. And we will see a shift of the peak towards lower frequencies. So now let's let an oxygen atom to the mix and form an OH group. Oxygen has high electronegativity, which means that it attracts electrons and it even attracts the electron belonging to the hydrogen atom. So the electron density around the hydrogen proton decreases. There is less shielding from B0 and the effective field Bn that the proton feels increases a little bit. And thus the Lamo frequency increases a little as well. And the peak that we observe shifts back towards higher frequencies. So the Lamo frequency depends critically on the chemical environment of the protons. And this is why protons in different chemical environments, as in different molecules, will produce peaks at different frequencies. Richard is going to tell you more about that in his lecture, The MR Spectrum. But for now, just take a moment, look at this beautiful spectrum before we head into the final stretch of this introduction lecture. In the last few minutes, let's learn how we limit the MR signal that we detect to a certain spatial origin. I've briefly mentioned before that RF pulses are one of the two basic building blocks of any MR experiment. So-called field gradients are the other building block. Field gradients are creating additional strong magnetic fields that are superposed on B0. And the term gradient already tells you what's special about them. They have a linear strength gradient. And it allows us to make the strength of the external magnetic field depending on the spatial position. So on the left, we see an X gradient, meaning that the resulting field is stronger in the left side of the MR scanner than the right. In the middle, we see a Y gradient, meaning that the resulting field is stronger in the upper part of the scanner than the lower. And on the right, we see a Z gradient, meaning that the resulting field is stronger at the far end of the scanner than at the near end. Now recall that the Lamo frequency is directly proportional to the magnetic field. In the case on the left hand side, the field is constant and independent of the spatial position X. And the Lamo frequency is therefore exactly the same, regardless of the position of the spins. In the case of the right hand side, we have an X gradient superposed. The resulting field grows linearly with the spatial position X. And therefore a linear change in position translates to a linear change in Lamo frequency. So specifically, each position X now has a unique Lamo frequency. So field gradients are used all the time in the magnetic resonance world. In fact, MR imaging doesn't work without them. And using them seems kind of logical and straightforward to us now, but in fact, the idea that you deliberately make the magnetic field inhomogeneous to imprint spatial information onto your signals, that was revolutionary in the 70s. And Sir Peter Mansfield and Paul Lauterbur received the Nobel Prize for it because it paved the way towards using uh, MR as an imaging modality. So let's see how this works. In this figure, we have a field gradient that is applied along the Z direction from foot to head. And as we've seen before, each Z position is therefore characterized by a specific Lamo frequency. And we now apply a specific type of RF pulse, a so-called band selective pulse. This pulse is designed to excite only protons within a certain range of Lamo frequencies, 
while causing no excitation outside of that frequency band. In the presence of a gradient, which, remember, links spatial position directly to the Lamov frequency, exciting spins only within a certain range of Lamov frequency means exciting spins only within a certain range of spatial positions. And that is what we call a slice. Now, how thick is this slice? Well, that depends on both the width of the range of frequencies that are excited by the pulse, and we call that the bandwidth, and also by the strength of the gradient, because that determines how strong the Lamov frequency changes in space. A stronger gradient causes the field to vary faster in space, and for a pulse with the same bandwidth, that means a thinner slice. Really briefly, let's look at the band selective pulses that we need. When exciting a slice, we want maximal signal excitation inside the frequency range and as little as possible outside of that range. Remember the square pulse, where we just switched on the additional magnetic field B1 for a while? We can, to a first approximation, determine its excitation profile by taking the envelope of the RF pulse and taking the Fourier transform of it. This is then a plot of how much transversal magnetization we achieve over a range of frequencies. Unfortunately, we see that for the square pulse, we get very uneven excitation. So it's quite strong in the central lobe, but there are considerable ripples outside of that range. So that's not really a slice selective excitation. Fortunately, there's a whole area of research that does nothing else but optimize RF pulses. And it turns out that we can generate better pulse shapes where B1 actually changes over the time of the pulse duration. And we get something that looks like this. This is much more like we would want it to be, a profile with a clear, strong excitation within a range of frequencies and practically zero outside of that range. The bandwidth is here often defined as the range where the excitation is above 50% of the maximum, and it's called full width and half maximum, FWHM. And that is another term that you'll probably hear more about later throughout this course. In the MRS world, we frequently see the signal localized from a cuboid volume. And this is essentially done by doing slice selection with band selective RF pulses and field gradients three times. So each time the gradient direction is different. So in the first step, we generate signal from a slice. The second step reduces the signal origin to the slab that is the intersection of two perpendicular slices. And the third step reduces the signal again to the cuboid that is the intersection of this slab with a third perpendicular slice. And this is what we refer to as single voxel MRS. Well, with this, you're at the end of your fast ride through NMR physics, very much from the uh, humble beginnings of looking at a compass needle through to hopefully actually understanding how we generate a spectroscopy signal. So don't be too concerned if you have not understood every little detail. Remember, NMR is a phenomenon that is often really taught within a semester across several lectures. Um, for now, take some pride in the fact that you have learned a bit of physics that is so utterly fundamental that it won the uh, Nobel Prize in 1952, jointly for Edward Purcell and Felix Bloch. This is a page out of Bloch's notebook, and you might actually see a spot, of, um, spot a thing or two that you've seen in the course of this lecture. Um, with that, I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm very much looking forward um, to the Q&A and discussion during breakfast at the first day of editing school. And I see you all in Mexico. Safe trip.